two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula Podcast with Mark and James here in your house of chat about everything from the uh, writing world that you need to know, stuff about writing, reading, publishing, covers, making money from your books. Basically, this is what this is about. It's about people who want to earn an income from their writing. I mean, there's no reason not to listen to it if you just simply want to write uh, as a hobby. But a lot of our talk and discussion is about turning your hobby into something that pays you. And Mark, I guess you are an example of somebody who, as a little boy, thought about writing and was always there. And this indie revolution has changed your life. Let's just remind ourselves of that. It certainly has. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I, I started writing in my early teens, I think. So I was probably, well, probably younger than that, really. So, yeah, I've always wanted to be a writer um, and had a couple of false starts, as people probably know. And um, only in the last four or five years ago, four or five years has it become something that I've been able to do um, as, a, as a full-time job. So, yes, we, we love it. And you've done it well because this year could be a million-dollar revenue year for you in selling your books. <laughs> Uh, it looks like it at the, the moment, although September has been a little slower than I'd like, as I've been posting in the Facebook group. It's actually dropped down to about, I, I need basically I need to make $2,000 a day in order to um, hit a million. And normally, that I, I'm way above that, normally nearer 3,000. But the last three or four days, it's been, it's been quite low, actually. And the, the, a couple of the days have been the lowest I've had this year. Um, so not quite under 2,000, but getting close to that. So... Yeah, getting a little bit. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure why. It could be any number of reasons. Um, but the the kind of good news is, I've got a new book coming out at the end of the month, and I've had, I'll have five thousand pre-orders on that by, I don't know, probably this week. Um, and and that's at four ninety nine. So that that's on its own is between what fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. So that's that's quite. It'll be a quite nice um, bump for the end of this month and the, and the start of next month. So I'm still pretty confident, but we'll yeah. see. Well, if you don't make a million dollars this year, uh, it's your on fault. Our, our, well, our first podcast <laughs> episode of 2019 can be why I failed as an author. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. No, that's um, I'm I'm pretty confident, but we'll see. We'll see. I'll keep everyone posted. Yeah, that's good. Um, and successes are to be shared. Uh, it doesn't sound very British, that, doesn't it, Sharon? So we don't normally don't, but we do on this podcast. And we've had uh, lots of stories of people not necessarily making a million dollars a year, but people suddenly making a couple of thousand or a thousand dollars a month, which can be life changing. That sort of extra pays their mortgage suddenly and brings them a step closer to living that dream of writing full time. Mm. And today we can tell you that uh, an alumni of the 101 course, Imogen Clark, who lives in the north of England. And, alumnus. Uh, as alumnus. Oh, I think I put alumni on Twitter. I'll get picked up on that then. <laughs> um, alumni is, is plural, is it? If you know your Latin, okay. An alumnus of 101, uh, Imogen Clark, is number one in the UK-wide Kindle store today with her, but which is absolutely fantastic. We're thrilled for Imogen. And she did the 101 course, gave her book the visibility. I think it had been there for some time, but gave the book all the visibility in the platform that you talk about that you need to have in place to be successful. And pretty quickly, her sales went up and she got a phone call from Amazon because their algorithm ticked and and they've offered her a three-book deal, which is perfect for her. It's what she wanted to do. And she's now, um, well, number one, bestseller. How yeah, cool she's, that? she's done amazing. I remember I introduced her to... Um, the Amazon publishing team after they'd emailed her at the Harrogate Crime Festival last year. So I was up there to I don't know, hang about, I suppose. And um, I saw um, a couple of the guys from APUB and I introduced him, Imogen to them before these guys they were possibly as they were negotiating. And um, yeah, she's, she's signed on and is doing amazingly. So number one in the UK at the moment, which is uh, fills us with pride. We're very, very pleased for her. It does. You can follow Imogen at Imogen Clark on Twitter, Clark without an E. Um, okay, now we have a get together coming up, a chance for the millionaire Mark Dawson to buy you a beer. Uh, that's going to happen. Yet. It, not yet. Well, maybe. Yeah, he's probably not going to buy beers now because he's nervous about running, being only only making nine hundred thousand uh, dollars this year. Um, 
We should say this is your gross revenue, right? Before people think yes. that you've got a million dollars in the bank as a result of this. Of course, lots of spending on uh, yeah. on Facebook ads and so on. But if you want to get into the detail of that, Mark posts a lot of this information, including those figures, into the Facebook group so you can follow closely the business side of things. Uh, but we are going to get together in Florida, in St. Pete Beach, which is close to St. Petersburg uh, on the Gulf Coast there. Very lovely venue, the Trade Winds Grand Resort. We're going to be in the Shark Tooth Tavern, which is just as cool as it sounds, on uh, Wednesday the 26th of September. Wednesday the 26th of September in the Shark Tooth Tavern in St. Pete Beach, which is uh, part of the Trade Winds Resort. I think it's called Golf Boulevard, the road, uh, the strip that runs along there. And we will buy you a beer and we may even give you an SPF pin, which is something to behold. It is. Yeah, I'll have a bag full of them. So uh, we'll probably if I remember, but they're, they're, they're very nice pins. Recommended. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Well, we, we, we love it when people come, al- come along and say hello to us. And uh, I shall be there with my video camera as well. So uh, probably be grabbing a few of you for, for chats one way or another. Good. Right. Now, this episode is about audiobooks. Actually, it's partially about audiobooks, but also about uh, nonfiction. So uh, the audiobooks books section of this interview applies equally to fiction and non-fiction. There's lots of stuff about choosing the correct voiceover artist and where to place and how to do all this stuff and um, some of the ins and outs of it. Uh, from a writer, a non-fiction writer, who's going great guns and has a good non-fiction business, so I took the opportunity to talk about NF stuff as well. Um, we have quite an NF audience and uh, often we get questions about whether the type of thing that Mark talks about applies to non-fiction and I know Mark your answer and Joe Penn's answer for instance is look at us if you think that non-fiction uh, isn't a, a relevant thing for fiction authors to think about clearly having even if it's a smaller side hustle that we've you've built quite a monster with SPF and Joe Penn's non-fiction side of her business outweighs I think her fiction side but people like I was looking at Garrett Robinson we've had him on the podcast before I visited Garrett up in Oregon in the past and he writes fantasy books and he's done very well thanks to your course mark but he has also developed i think quite a good non-fiction following because he's talking to other writers which is the obvious route for good writers and good marketing writers to go down so he's got a really good youtube channel he works really hard at that um and that's a type of thing that even if you think well i haven't got a particular skill or expertise well if you're successfully writing and selling books actually you do have a skill and expertise so non-fiction is, is an important part of uh, the writing business, and some people may not have even thought of it. It is. It's not for everyone. Um, so, you know, not everyone wants to teach and not everyone has the time to effectively set up another business, but there are plenty of authors who've done that now. So David Goggin was probably the first I can think of, um, well, or Joe Penn, those two have been doing it for a long time. Um, Adam Croft has, has recently published a book on um, mindset, so that's a non-fiction book for Adam. Um, Chris Fox does that. There are there are quite a lot of authors um, kind of moving into that space or just adding that to their um, to their other their fiction books. Um, and it's you know it's, it does make sense. I mean I, I'm I'm all for um, mitigating risk and uh, the more income streams that you can have, the, the the more you're insulating yourself if one thing goes tits up. So if my books suddenly stop working. Then obviously we have got SPF, or if SPF stop work, stops working, then I could uh, concentrate more on books. So there's lots of um, ways that you can uh, insulate yourself from those kinds of uh, you know, vicissitudes. There's another big word for the day um, of of just just general business. So yeah, I'm, I'm it's not for everyone, but I, I think it, it can be quite sensible in some circumstances. Okay, well, look, our guest is very authoritative on uh, on the subjects of both non-fiction and, in particular, audiobooks and why you should be thinking seriously about audiobooks. Her name is Tina Dietz. Let's hear from Tina. Tina, welcome to the SPF podcast. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, James. It's our pleasure. Well, look, what we normally do before we get into the meat of the subject, and we're going to be talking nonfiction and audiobooks in particular today, is we hear a little bit about our guest. So why don't you give us the uh, the lowdown on who Tina Dietz is? Wow. Okay. Well, it's been a long and twisty journey, but what I do now is I work with um, people who are subject matter experts, authors, leaders, 
And I work my company, we work with them to get their message out all over the world. So more influence, bigger audiences. And I also personally work one on one with authors and leaders to help hone their voice and their message so that they're making the impact that they want to impact. And the majority of our company, what we do is a lot of audio publishing. We take audiobooks from start to finish and do distribution. And we also do that with podcasting as, as well. So kind of all aspects of getting your voice out to the world is, is what we do. And I personally have a very mixed background as a therapist, as an entrepreneur, lifelong entrepreneur. I grew up inside of my parents' business and also as a, as a business coach and a, and a speaker. I fell into the whole audio side of things because of my own love of, quite honestly, being on stage. I was that drama kid in high school and went on to do some work with voice acting, and that kind of led me down this path of, of audio as I was building other businesses. So it all kind of converged. Okay. And your customers today, your clients, are they are mainly from the kind of digital entrepreneur space, or do you have very traditional clients as well who want a piece of that action? No, it really ranges across the board. I think the thing that that holds all of my clientele together in terms of the umbrella is that they're all experts in something. They're all deeply passionate and deeply knowledgeable about what they do. And they're looking for ways to reach people even more from uh, the sense of wanting to reach the right people and get their message out there and kind of leave a legacy. They're, they all have a purpose. They all have a kind of a mission to get out there. Uh, so that's more important to them many times than even the financial rewards of of, of the book or, or what they're doing, although they get both. Okay. So you're not a fan of the kind of CEO who sits there with his spreadsheets and tries to deliver shareholder value. You're a fan of the person who runs a business <laughs> because it's their passion, because they've there's, there's a reason for, the, for them doing it. Yeah, I mean, I actually have um, a, a close colleague who runs a company called STJ Solutions, and they do bioremediation. Uh, they're cleaning up the world's water supply, and it's something I'm super passionate about. They're super passionate about, and uh, so one of the co-founders, Robin Thompson, always says there's two rules about business: one, don't screw anyone over ever, and two, make sure you make a profit. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that seems it's good. It's pretty basic. <laughs> yeah. Pretty basic, right? Yeah. But yeah, so uh, spreadsheets and, and making money and all of that, absolutely, because you can help more people. And you can do all that inside of something that is purpose-driven as well. That's something that I, I think you can have it all. You don't have to be poor in order to make a difference in the world or to be spiritual or to be holy or any of those kind of things. Well, clearly I could go off on a tangent about that. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Tangents are okay. Um, and you're, I know you're big on creativity and you talk uh, about mm -hmm. creativity being an important part of business. And you're not just talking about the creative industries, which many of the people listening to this podcast will be as writers in the creative industry. You're talking about creativity in every business. Yes, creativity as a human feature. It's something that we're all imbued with in one way or another. And you don't have to consider yourself to be an artist to be creative. We all kind of have a creative drive. We all want to leave something in this world kind of after us, whether that's our kids or a business or a message or a book or a series of books or whatever the case may be. And I think that giving ourselves permission to access that creativity, it gives us access to moving through problems a lot faster. So this creativity requires curiosity. And curiosity is the antidote to shame. And it's only shame that keeps us or fear of being judged, which is really the same thing, that keeps us from getting our message out into the world or keeps us from creating that book or, you know, getting that message out there or kind of the whole make your dreams come true thing that we grew up with as kids that we tend to squash a little bit as adults. So creativity and curiosity, the access points to bringing all that back and really being productive. Yeah, I think that does touch uh, uh, on very much the area that our audience are in. And uh, I'm in, in in writing a book, there is definitely uh, some of that. So let's talk a little bit about audiobooks. So audiobooks still, funnily enough, even with our audience and our SPF community, for, for very many people, they're a bit of a, I'll get round to it when I've got time. But other <laughs> yes. people rave about audiobooks. In fact, someone on this podcast said not that long ago, it should be a priority right at the beginning. And I think you're probably going to be in that camp, right? 
I think many times it, it is a priority and that's just simply because of the priority well not even looking at the priority but the the popularity of audiobooks they're the one area of publishing that has been on double digit every year year after year sales increase for the last five or six years i mean it's going to break five three point five billion dollars in sales this year wow wow so yeah. your your audio books just talk to us about your personal ones and then i know you, you help other people right you you, are, you have a kind of service you're a non-fiction business person we would call it in the trade in the author trade in mm -hmm. that you have a a service your books are about a practical thing do you use audio books yourself I, in terms of being a consumer, yes, I do listen to audiobooks and podcasts uh, frequently. It's it's really a matter of convenience more than anything, it, besides the fact that I enjoy them. It's like having a conversation or, in the case of audiobooks, storytelling. You know, storytelling is our kind of oldest form, oral history, passing stories around the fire. We're just, we're wired for stories and we're wired for storytelling. And audiobooks are a part of that. And I, I, it's just not an, it's not a new thing. You know? No, and I suppose, sorry. I suppose what I meant was, do you have your own authored audio books as well as the audio books you help your clients produce? I spend so much time working with my authors that my own books keep getting put on the back burner, and I know a lot of authors out there can relate to that. <laughs> okay, so all right, so let's talk about the service that you provide and what you do from beginning to end on audio. But what are the key things that people should be getting right with audio books? A couple of things. The biggest question that I get about audiobooks is, should I narrate the book myself or should I work with a professional narrator? And particularly in the world of nonfiction, this comes up every single time. I very rarely do I ever hear a fiction author, because I still speak to groups of fiction authors and um, no, I love working with fiction authors, but they tend to be, you know, there are differences in what most people are thinking about the purpose of their audiobook. So whereas nonfiction authors are looking to get out their message, and yes, they want to sell books, yes, they want to sell a lot of books, but they also tend to be looking at their book as part of building their professional platform, building their credibility, and building visibility for the other conduits that they have for income. Whereas fiction authors primarily are looking to sell books, period, full stop. And so it's a bit of a different animal but in, in terms of the marketing between the two worlds. But the process is very, very much the same. Except that as a fiction author, I would say you never ever want to narrate your own book. Whereas with a nonfiction author, I would say about 75% of the time you don't want to narrate your own right. book. <laughs> There's a few exceptions to that rule, even though a lot of nonfiction authors will say, well, this is my story. I have to narrate it. And I would come back and say, well, yes, you can do that. And is it actually going to make a difference in building your platform? Is it going to make a difference in the number of books you sell? Because we find that nine times out of 10, it doesn't. And in the, in the case of a, a poorly narrated audiobook, it can actually hurt the author. Yeah. What are the exceptions then? People who happen to have a natural talent for it, or if you're if you happen to be Richard Branson and people are expecting to hear your voice? There there's a certain number of followers that if you have or you've got a certain, you know, notoriety, or you have a publisher that is willing to invest in the process for you and get you a director and get you a studio and get you coaching and all those other things you need to really produce a quality audiobook. Absolutely, you're, you're going to want to do that. But we tend to find that unless you have a large audience, and I, when I say a large audience, I mean half a million or more um, of people who are used to hearing your voice, then we don't see any difference in, in the sales numbers. And in the case of people who have large followings, but let's say that they're bloggers or writers and people aren't used to hearing their voices, we still don't see a difference uh, on the back end or in a difference in, in the sales numbers. And so since it is such a learning curve, even for professional speakers, people who have been on stages for decades, it is a different skill set when you get behind the microphone and do an audiobook. So it, it really depends on if they want to have that skill set and invest the extra amount of time and energy and money that it takes to narrate a book yourself versus work with a professional narrator. Yeah, it is. Um, 
it's a bit like acting, I think, uh, narrating a book. Oh, yeah. And so it's one question to ask yourself is how good an actor are you? How much acting have you done? If the answer to that is not very good and none, then then definitely get a professional, I would say. Exactly, exactly. Very much like that. Okay, so the process then, let's assume that we've made a good decision and we're going to get somebody in to narrate our book. And I guess there's a significant difference between fiction and nonfiction here. But what process should you go through in choosing the right voice for your book? This is important, right, to get that voice right. It's it's the most important thing that has to go in. And we, we've kind of developed a process because I've been on the voice acting side as well as the business side of things, we act as, a, as an intermediary so that then the voice actors get what they need and want and our our authors get what they want as well. So when you're looking for a good narrator or a great narrator, there's a, a couple of things that are to come into play. One is that narrators can work on in two different ways. One is through what's called a royalty share which is where there's no upfront cost to the author and then you split the proceeds for the next seven years, 50-50. And the other way is through something called um, per finished hour. And um, every finished hour of audio, an, you know, an hour of an audio book, takes about five to six hours for a professional to produce. It's wow. not a short amount of time. But that yeah. includes all the editing that goes afterwards. All the and, editing, okay. all the mastering, uh, the okay. corrections, all of okay. that. So per finished hour is the other way to that narrators will, you know, work. And um, that can range anywhere from $50 per finished hour, which I don't recommend that you offer, <laughs> to $600 per finished hour and up. Okay. So it really just kind of depends on where, you, you know, the type of narrator you want. If you want someone who is in the actors union, who's in SAG-AFTRA, um, you know, a lot of them are out in LA and do this all the time. And this is what they do. If you want somebody who's can really do the robust voices that you want, say in a fiction book, then you're going to, you're talking about offering about $225 and up per finished hour. Okay. If you don't want somebody who's in the union, you can offer less, you know, generally we recommend anywhere in the 150 to $200 per finished hour range. And how many words go into a finished hour so that people can try and work out how much it would cost to get their oh, book done? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the rule of thumb is about 10,000 words per finished hour. Okay. Okay, so a 100,000 word book would be 10 hours. Absolutely. Yeah, of that. Okay, so that's a reasonable investment. And um, you know, funnily enough, you said five hours per one hour finished and I come from a TV world before this, where in, even in news, which was slapdash and thrown together, we were an hour for a minute, for a finished minute. Exactly. And in costume drama, one of my colleagues who worked over in costume drama told me that they were 10 hours per minute of, of work effort that goes in. So five hours per hour is pretty good in terms of production. It is pretty, it is pretty good. And if you for, don't know anything production. about this world, it's very easy to underestimate that and wonder what, what on earth all that time going into. But production, well, you can probably have a look around both our rooms. There's a lot of equipment, a lot of time goes into. Recording this interview is just the beginning of getting this podcast out, right, as you well know. Oh, definitely. Okay, so you, you choose your actor. Um, you have these various options in price terms, I guess. And in terms of, of tone, um, mm -hmm. if you're a fiction, if you're a non-fiction author, talk about non-fiction for a second, I'm guessing that the gender is going to be your gender. It would probably not make sense if your name's Dave to have yeah. a female voice, although I wouldn't rule it out, but it would probably not make sense. Fiction, I don't know what the answer is, is... is is the genre, is it going to be a kind of gender stereotypical set of romance genres go with a female voice and the thrill of genres go with a male voice? That's actually been a big change in the audiobook industry in the last 10 years. It used to be when it was all just traditional publishers doing the publishing that no matter what the character, main character was in the book, the gender of the narrator always went with the author's gender, which oh, okay. always blew my mind. It was hmm. really, really strange. In the last 10 years, with the rise of self-publishing and the rise of, I think, more common sense, I think we're seeing a lot more gender matching with the, the, the main character's gender. And because it, it makes more sense with, with fiction, if you've got a, a female lead that you're going to have primarily a a female narrator. And a, a lot of people ask me about, well, if I have a female narrator, how are they going to do the male voices? That's why it's voice acting. Yeah. And people have to do the acting. You can do more than one narrator. You can do what's called full cast production, but that gets fairly complicated and also gets fairly expensive. So you will rarely see 
uh, full cast production in anything but major New York Times bestselling books. Okay, I mean that. I mean that's getting into radio play territory, right? Moving away from yeah. a, a voice radio book. drama. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can imagine that whole different thing. Okay, and so um, that makes sense to me. I mean, J.K. Rowling is a woman, but you probably, with most of the voices in that book, are male. There's a couple of distinctive female voices in there, but exactly. it would not necessarily make sense to automatically go with a female voice just because she's called Joanna. But anyway, so I'm pleased we've moved on a little bit from that. <laughs> although I don't know, I don't know what yeah, voice they use. Um, and so then in terms of the actual um, tone of the voice, again, this is going mm-hmm. to be how, I mean, how do you get, I, I, I pick up voice over artists for our professional work, our video work. In fact, we just, we're getting a new voice for the podcast done at the moment. So we use some of these online sites and you get 25 people record a sentence or two that you've written and you can listen to all the voices and make a choice. And I quite like that, uh, that process. Is a similar thing available to people, that sort of audition process available to people choosing for their book? Yeah, if you're in the US, Canada, Ireland, or the UK, you can use the self-publishing portal for Audible, Amazon, and iTunes that's called ACX. That stands for audiobookcreationexchange.com. And you can audition narrators through that platform. Um, It'll ask you all kinds of questions. There's a learning curve certainly to go through. And you can audition all kinds of narrators from all over the world. And and we actually use ACX in conjunction with our other resources um, to send out auditions for up to maybe seven to 10,000 narrators per book. And we get back anywhere from 80 to 150 auditions per book that then we have to go through. And so choosing your audition is is actually an important part, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. You don't want it to be too long. You, you want to really choose one to two strong paragraphs. And you also want to let your narrators know in the audition process what types of characters they're going to need to narrate. Because if you've got a strong female lead character who is, you know, a, some a, a, I'll pick a popular thing right now, who is an assassin, and, you know, it's kind of hard boiled and it's some sort of, um, you know, lives in some sort of supernatural world. But then you've got a whole other cast of supporting characters that are very different from that main narrative voice. You're going to need to let in the audition process, the narrators know that so that they can actually self-select. You'll get a way better selection of more qualified narrators if you give them more information about your characters overall up front. Because you can't ask an, a whole bunch of, of voice actors to give you five pages of audition just to get every single one of your characters kind of you know played out in an audition. You won't get auditions if you do that. It's actually kind of offensive to voice actors if you do that Um, but if you yeah they spend so much time on just the audition um that makes them think that you're going to be a difficult author to work with so it's really best to allow the narrators to come forward and show you what they can do for you and allow them to make suggestions on different characters if an author is more open to that it's really helpful and on the nonfiction side it's not all that different we're looking for what we say the spirit of the author in our narrators, a good energetic match. Are they believable? If you're talking about marketing, do you believe that that narrator knows what they're talking about when it comes to marketing? Or if they're talking about money and abundance, same kind of thing, or or if it's um, a memoir of some kind, can you believe that they actually experienced what was happening in at, for the uh, for the author at that time, so that's what we're we're listening for, and there's particular ways of listening for that. The audition process is crucial. Yeah, yeah, and I can imagine it being quite tricky. Um, just thinking about the fiction side first, we'll talk about nonfiction. I mean, one of the things that authors say to me, in fact, an Irish author said to me uh, this last week in London, we were chatting, is that she once her books are out there, and she started gathering traction. She was really surprised by who her audience was. So she had an idea who her audience was going to be, and they, she thought predominantly female, and it came out about a 50-50 split, and the age was a bit younger than she thought. And so if you've got this idea of your book, and you're listening for that voice that's going to tell the book, that's basically your idea of the book, but your book becomes 
in the ownership of your readers and they may hear a different voice. So I wonder if one thing that fiction authors could do is to use their advanced reader teams and ask them who they think, what sort of voice to to get some extra input. Because particularly fiction, if it's a series, you're probably going to stick with that voice for a few books, a big decision. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a fantastic use of advanced reader teams. Um, (laughs) I think everybody needs to do that repeatedly if they can uh in that process because it, it it's just like you're, if you're a master carpenter you know you measure twice you cut once if you're going to release an audiobook prior or or with you the other versions of your book and you're not going to wait and kind of feel out your audience and and see how that goes then you definitely need to use advanced readership teams to and focus groups or however you want to say that as your audience to make sure that you're honed down into that right kind of voice. As yeah. a matter of fact, one of the things I recommend for authors is that uh, if what, before you send your book into editing even, you need to read your book out loud yourself because you will actually get a better sense of who your characters are by saying their voices out loud. And you'll catch a lot of mistakes or a lot of strange places in your narrative that are awkward that you wouldn't normally catch by scanning it with your eyes. Yeah, that's a really good tip. A lot of editors say the same thing um, before you hand it over to a proofreader, uh, at least read it out loud. Okay, well, let's talk about nonfiction a little bit. And we do talk a lot to fiction authors on this podcast. I'm keen that we talk as much as possible to nonfiction as well, because lots of people are in that space and it's a growing, very, very fast growing space. So nonfiction, again, you talked earlier about that credibility, depending on the subject, that kind of believability. I guess one thing that runs through both of these is clarity. So whilst uh, if you've got a predominantly English speaking audience or probably an exclusive English speaking audience for a lot of books, uh, whilst it might be romantic to have um, a Spanish accent or a Dutch accent or something, you've got to think, I guess, about something that's going to be an easy listen for people who aren't native to that language. Oh, definitely. Although if if the author is native to, say, Germany, or uh, we've had a number of, you know, some authors in the UK, we want to honor that and make sure that there's not too much of a disparity between the author's voice and the narrator's voice. So it needs to be clear, like you mentioned. And at the same time, we have to trust our audience to be able to kind of get with the program yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and be able to tolerate it. So as long as the as long as the um, the accent isn't too heavy, it's it's not a problem. It's, yeah. it, and that's really where having a, a deeply finessed uh, narrator really comes into play. But truly, if if the book is in another language, we can produce the audiobook in any language. Yeah. As, as long as we have the, the accurate translation. I suppose a better example may have been um, strong regional accents, which in the US can get quite strong, but in Britain or yes. the United Kingdom can get really strong. I can go to places in the UK and not understand, you know, understand every third word that's being spoken. So that is um, a colloquial language is nice, but it's got to be a balance, as you say, with clarity. Exactly. We tend to go for the most familiar accents. So I can't even begin to parse apart because I haven't been traveled ex- as extensively in the UK as I would have liked. But you're right. The regional accents are, they're so varied. And in the US, they are, you know, can get kind of crazy as well. So we tend to go for a more neutral, err on the side of a more neutral accent or a more, we'll call it a classical accent rather than something that has a lot of regionalism in it because it can it can start to grate on people's uh, ears. Yeah. Okay. So for your nonfiction audience, um, are you, you talked about nonfiction authors and we, we see this a lot using their books as lead generators, as, as gather, gathering visibility and interest. Can audiobooks also turn a profit for nonfiction authors? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of nonfiction listeners are in the are, they tend to be college graduates, and they tend to have more affluent households, and they tend to be over 30. So in terms of people who are, let's say it upwardly mobile, uh, and professional, audiobooks have a huge audience. And so either they're looking to become better or they're looking for specific resources and areas of interest to them, whether that's business or parenting or spirituality or health, then 
the thing, the rise of audiobooks and why they're so popular is because of their mobility. And people who are in that kind of demographic category are people who are really busy people. So they love to have the portability of the audiobook because you can listen to audio just like podcasting. When you can't read a book, you can listen to it. When you can't watch a video, you can still listen. And so these people are always on the go. And and that's why audiobooks have become so popular is because it's the most accessible form of media, audio. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, well, podcasting has been a revolution. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about podcasting before we finish, because uh, that does also uh, work very mu- nicely for nonfiction uh, in the nonfiction space. But the way people listen today has changed dramatically simply because of that time of choosing. It's happening on TV as well, but you're still sat in front of your TV when you press buttons and watch everything on demand. In the old days, you had to sit there when things started. But because you can walk about with your radio programs now, your podcasts and your audio books, suddenly people are devouring books, doing their washing up, um, loading, you know, doing the, the hoovering, hoovering or doing their jogging. And that's changed everything, really. It really has. James, remember when we used to have to get up and walk across the room to change the channel on the television? Well, I had servants, but they did that for me. Because no, I'm, <laughs> I'm British. No, no. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, I'm, I'm clearly both a heathen and a barbarian, yeah, so no. I understand. I remember yeah. my first chum who had one of these chunky remote controls, and uh, yeah, we dreamed of having that one day. And everything right? Ex- everything oh, exchange it was like magic. But the best bit, I mean, the technology, I'm a bit geeky, I like the technology, but that's irrelevant compared to the liberating aspect of what it brings. And the fact that you can go on a car journey, you can go for a, a you know, a 10 mile, a 10 kilometer jog, I'll probably measure myself on 10 kilometers, not 10 miles. And you can listen to an entire audio book in a couple of days or, or, or learn a new subject or learn a new language as some people do. Although actually learning languages was something that did adopt this very early on actually before the podcast revolution i remember the adverts on tv where you get a set of headphones sent to you with all these cds so they knew early on that this was you know a valuable way of taking on information but anyway okay so let's talk a little about podcasting uh we're on a podcast you do a podcast so we know about podcasts why are these important for people to understand that there's a place for them in business oh geez in business we find that um most most experts come to me looking to launch a podcast thinking that they're going to grow their audience. And they tend to be people who would prefer to speak rather than write. And they also want to have a platform that allows them to connect with other influential people and feature you know, guests and or feature their own expertise. But what they don't tend to know is there's two different types of podcasting. There's podcasting as a business, and there's podcasting for your business. And what most people in the business world do is they podcast for their business, which means that they're looking to generate leads, they're looking to build an audience, they're looking to become more influential. Those types of podcasts are excellent for you know doing all those things, spreading the word, spreading your message. They don't tend to, on their own, generate a lot of income. They might generate sponsorship down the road. They certainly can develop a lot in in the way of um, return on your investment uh, in relationships, tremendous return on your return on on relationships. However, podcasting as a business is a different animal. And that is where you're you're really developing a, a show that has income potential right off the bat. It's a show that is tapping into an existing audience that is really hungry for additional content and already has tremendous popularity. So for example, um, the Trivial Warfare podcast took the concept of pub trivia and turned it into a podcast. So kind of like a game show. Very, very popular podcast, does great with all kinds of sponsorship. Uh, My friend Glenn uh, owns the Horse Radio Network. Horse people love, I mean, they're, they're just nuts about horses, right? They spend so much time and energy and money on horses. And he's in that world. And he's developed, I think, now a network with more than a dozen shows with all the different facets of horses and has this tremendous business that is sponsor driven because people love listening to all these different shows about horses. But that's a very different animal than somebody who is, say, um, 
uh, Michael Kitsis, one of the shows that I launched some some years ago. He's a financial expert with a large following, very prolific in his content, and had a day a week where he wasn't publishing blog content and decided he was going to do a podcast to accommodate those people who really wanted to be listening rather than reading. And his podcast took off like crazy because he already had built an audience. On the other hand, uh, another show I launched, um, Katrina Ubel, who has the Weight Loss for Physicians podcast, was focused on a very, very niche audience of overworked physicians who wanted to lose weight. I mean, that you'd think about that. And it's, that is a niche audience. Yeah. But she's done extremely well, gets tens of thousands of downloads per episode because she is niche down. And she's really speaking specifically to an audience that wants her message and her information. And that's a solo show. She's not doing interviews. And it has built her business tremendously. And she launched that show right from the get-go of her business. She didn't have a pre-existing audience. So it can work a lot of different ways. Wow. Show me the niches. I'll show you the riches, the old, uh, the old saying right. goes and still works. Um, so the... The main income stream is sponsorship. That's the one you kept coming back to in terms of a podcast that makes money is likely to be via sponsorship rather than selling a product. Well, you're either generating leads for your own product or you are offering sponsorships. Um, the third way of generating money is something that I've been encouraging a lot of ind independent po podcasters to consider, which is what I call uh, reciprocal reciprocal marketing. And this is where you get, say, a group of physicians who are all have their own podcasts. And you basically um, spend time advertising on each other's podcast with the assumption that you have similar audiences. So none of you will necessarily change money might not change hands. But it's more of a cooperative arrangement or a collective arrangement where, let's say, Katrina's show, who I mentioned, she does weight loss for physicians. Um, another show that um, a doctor runs is called The, uh, the Science of Self-Help. And she gets on and she demystifies different aspects of self-help from the science. Well, if Katrina on her show wanted to say, hi, I'd recommend, I'd recommend that you listen to Dr. Jennifer Greer's show, The Science of Self-Help. And you can demystify all of those myths and what the science is of different self-help modalities. I suggest you give it a listen, check it out here. That would make sense and vice versa. So that's one of the things I'm encouraging independent podcasters to do is to kind of find their tribe and build your audience in a way that makes sense cooperatively. Okay. So is that the weight loss podcast aimed at doctors on how they can deliver weight loss to their patients or aimed at doctors themselves losing weight? Doctors themselves losing weight. I thought that's what you were saying. That is niche. Yeah, very niche. And she's got a huge following. Wow, good. There's a niche. Okay, good. Well, I mean, I love podcasts and, uh, and we love producing them. And it's an unexpected part of my life that because I've wanted to be a broadcaster since I was little and that's why I joined the BBC and slaved away there for 12 years and I love microphones and being in studios and all of that always have done and I thought that was gone the day I walked out of the BBC and suddenly this podcast is a really important part of our business and uh, I love it so I, I'm a big advocate of it I know some people are terrified of it I mean sometimes we have guests who are nothing like as uh, confident and relaxed as, as you are we have guests who are terrified of being on air and uh, one of the things I say to people is that anybody can do this now the old idea of you being some kind of tv presenter is is rubbish you just have to be yourself and it's difficult, like everything. It takes a little get going. But once you start going, the more you do it, the more relaxed you'll become. And anybody can podcast. I completely agree. I completely agree. And it's really a matter of getting comfortable with your own voice and your own message and finding other people who feel the same way that you do. Great. Well, look, we've, uh, we've whizzed through our slot on this uh, uh, on this show we've got I'm just having a quick look down at your notes because you you kindly sent me some um, some stuff in advance Tina and I know that we haven't got around to a couple of things like for instance the work-life balance on it's something you think a lot about and that's something that does play into uh, our audience's mind a lot because uh, quite a few people are trying to get the career as an author going at the same time as having a nine-to-five job and authors quite often never switch off um, but this is something you obviously do a lot and you've managed to get some balance in your life or have you, or have you? 
I know. I like to think that I have, yes. Yeah. So that's an important, I know that's an important part of what people should do. So if people want to find out more, Tina, uh, where do they go? Oh, the easiest URL to find me at and find out everything that we've got going on is startsomethingpositive.com. And startsomethingpositive.com, you can find out about audiobooks, podcasting, and we do have a lot of tips on work-life balance, how to kind of get out of your own way, because that's something that I certainly have done a lot of work on myself with and work with lots and lots of clients, people from six, seven, eight different countries, 20 different industries around the world that I've been working with for decades now. So it's not just the external journey about publishing your book. It's about the internal journey about becoming who you are as an author and as someone who's got a message to give to the world. A storyteller. As we, uh, as we alluded to earlier, we are humans and we devour stories, always looking for the narrative. Tina, from Florida. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. We've really appreciated it. And uh, you can give that uh, website once again. Sure. Startsomethingpositive.com. Perfect. Tina, thank you very much. Thanks, James. When did you get into audiobooks, Mark? How is it uh, something that you did straight away at the beginning? Or did it take you a while to think about that? Um I think I was doing ACX as soon as it became possible to do it for the UK. Um, so I, I don't know how long ago, it must be three years ago now, something like that, that I, I did ACX. Um, and then uh, the Milton books, rather than do ACX, I decided I'd, I'd do a deal directly with Audible. So um, Audible Studios published those for me, just makes it a little easier. Would I make more money if I did it myself? Possibly. Um, but I do pretty well with Audible and it just it's one less thing that I have to worry about. Unfortunately, there's only one of me, so it, it's quite hard to do everything that I'd like to do myself. Sometimes it's necessary to, to hand it off to somebody else. Yeah. Well, there is a school of thought now that you should be getting into audiobooks very early on. It's not something to leave on the back burner later because it's it's potentially money on the table. And as Tina talked in, in her interview the growth of audiobooks is outstripping the growth of other areas of reading at the moment yeah it's definitely it's an area that people are getting into um and it's it's very convenient now um when i'm driving to wales this afternoon to do an amazon academy event with um louise ross or Orna, Orna ross I just realized there's two rosses and and me um and uh, and some amazonians so i've got two hours in the car and i'll probably listen to um to an audiobook i should imagine as i as i drive there so yeah it's absolutely absolutely a, a big growth area um and um, one that i think we'll see quite a lot of changes in the next 18 months or so Great. Well, Louise Ross, LJ Ross, who's a very very successful uh, author online. LJ. She yeah, she's been doing brilliantly and she's a good talk on the subject but she's been a little bit um shy i think or reluctant to do a podcast interview but we have nailed her down and i'm going to be uh meeting uh, lj ross in october in london so we're going to have a, a, a podcast interview with louise and i'm really looking forward to that so she's uh she's excellent on the subject she she does this on panels at various conferences as you allude to today yeah. but uh, I, she's one i've been chasing for the podcast for some time so i'm delighted we've uh, we've bagged her Right, right. That's it for this week. Bagged her. Uh, yes, bagged her. Good I know. You, I can. I can see you sliding down the carry-on <laughs> innuendo roll. No, it's like just, no, I just imagine you on the uh, in the African <laughs> savanna with a shotgun. Yes, we've bagged another guest. <laughs> I bagged another one. Um, I'm. A, I'm a lover, not a hunter. Um, a salad <laughs> roll. Right. <laughs> on that note, on that bombshell. Yes. Another reference down on Partridge. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope you found that interview useful with Tina and definitely think about audiobooks if it's not something you're getting into at the moment. But in particular, I found some of the practical advice from Tina very useful in that interview. She was a great guest, so we'll probably revisit her at some point. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Leave a review for us if you can at the various platforms wherever you get this podcast and you can drop us an email at any time. Support at selfpublishingformula.com if you want a particular guest on, you've got some questions for me and Mark. We'll probably do another masterclass episode in the next few weeks. So if there's areas that you'd like us to talk about, just let us know. That's it. Thank you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. 
If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Bye.